Hey everyone, it's Dave. Welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for tuning in as always. First of all, I do want to thank Mark Kiwi, who I have to assume is probably Mark H for joining the channel members. Much appreciated, Mark. And of course, Joe Dalio for rejoining. I understand I've been spelling your name wrong for quite a while, so apologies again for that. We also did have Mark Barlow join, but I think I mentioned him on the previous video. Okay, so with that out of the way, today we're covering the latest updates around the space industry, especially as it pertains to investors in the space industry. We've got a lot of news to cover from a variety of different companies, including a lot of the big space primes with news or reporting their earnings recently, and some very big news out of Raytheon that really took me off. Uh, also, some news about Rocket Lab and their launches and their cadence, as well as others. Before we dive into that, I hope you'll consider hitting subscribe if you do find this kind of content useful. If you're already subscribed, thank you so much, and all the likes always do help out with those algorithms. Okay, let's dive into this week's space industry updates. Starting off with some big news from Raytheon, or at least their parent company, RTX. They have announced that they'll be exiting the Space Prime business and won't be making SDA satellites anymore. So we did hear previously that they had canceled that contract with the SDA to make, I believe it was, seven missile tracking satellites. Just wasn't working out for them, cost overruns, structure problems, all the rest. But more interesting than even that story is the fact that they are now completely pivoting from a space prime to being more of a component supplier to the space primes, saying that I think when you look at our strengths in that portfolio, this pivot is the right one. I find this absolutely fascinating because Rocket Lab has been dead set on climbing that ladder to get up to the space prime level saying that they think they can unlock additional margin improvements and new projects and all that kind of thing meanwhile rtx or raytheon has decided that for them it makes more sense to kind of climb down the ladder being more of a merchant supplier to the primes i wonder you know are they both making the right move for their respective companies why is one so convinced that the prime route is the right way and the other is not personally I mean, it does just seem to make logical sense to me that if you control the entire project all the way up and down and you are the prime, you should be able to capture more margin than just component suppliers. But I'm sure Raytheon has their reasons and not the least of which is their struggles they've had recently, especially uh, the company I think in the past has been used to those cost plus contracts where, you know, overruns were kind of absorbed by the customer and often now we're getting fixed price contracts where overruns are having to be absorbed by the company themselves and they're having trouble dealing with that. So uh, that's one less prime competing for a lot of these major satellite contracts. Obviously, they already were awarded one SDA contract and they won't be competing for future ones. Uh, we do have some new primes though. Rocket Lab obviously considering themselves a space prime now MDA pretty new one as well as Sierra Space uh, came, coming a little bit out of nowhere with their new satellite bus and kind of getting the prime contractor role on some SDA contracts. So uh, definitely still a lot of competition in this space as Raytheon and RTX kind of take a step down the ladder. Now, we do, of course, need to mention that Boeing Starliner is finally going to fly very soon. This has obviously been much delayed and very exciting, so I, for one, will definitely be watching. I think we all are very familiar with the problems Boeing has had with this program, and I just, for one, am really looking forward to seeing, you know, the U.S. government trying to get some of their money's worth out of all this, and hopefully that vehicle will fly successfully. I do think, you know, it's been worked on for so long that it must be pretty safe by now. So good luck to Boeing and their Starliner on this mission. Now, in terms of Space Prime earnings, we did have Northrop Grumman to start with here. They reported pretty solid earnings with $10.13 in revenue for the quarter, representing a year-over-year -year increase of 9%, 6.32 EPS compared to 550 a year ago. So pretty solid numbers for them. We're mostly interested in the Space Systems Division here, which reported $3.66 billion in income versus the analyst estimate of $3.58 billion. So Space Systems for Northrop Grumman chugging along pretty nicely in this past quarter. 
Next up, we did have Lockheed Martin with net sales of $17.2 billion, net earnings of $1.5 billion or $6.39 per share. In terms of their space segment results, they did report an increase year over year compared to that quarter last year of $3 billion, $269 million versus last year, this quarter, $2 billion, $959 million. So pretty solid growth for another of these old school space companies as the overall space industry does continue to grow. Boeing is up next, and how? And I will have to admit up front that I don't think I would be an investor in this company right now. So many problems with their planes lately, so much going on in the news, and then obviously the SLS and the Starliner have experienced many delays, and I think from their space point of view, most fans of the industry would consider them to be a little bit troubled lately, to say the least. Boeing did actually report a gap loss per share of 56 cents and core non-gap loss per share of a buck 13. In terms of their space and security segment, we can see that the revenue numbers was pretty flat year over year, looking at 6.95 versus 6.53, so a modest increase there. But they do have... Uh, much better bottom line numbers in terms of earnings or loss from operations with 151 million versus that 212 million loss last year. Next up is Airbus. They did report a 20% drop in Q1 space revenue. The space division continuing to suffer the consequences of non-cash charges totaling 600 million euros in the second half of 2023, following program hiccups, including delays and cost overruns in its new OneSat software defined satellite product. One other item from Boeing is that they have said they will cut their SLS workforce due to external factors. Officials announced that there would be a significant number of layoffs and reassignments of people working on the program. So hopefully all those folks will be able to find positions elsewhere in the aerospace industry or within Boeing itself as the number of staff required for the SLS seems to be dropping. Okay, enough with Boeing. Now we have some news around Virgin Galactic, which stock continues to slide. And uh, yeah, it's looking pretty rough lately, I'm not going to lie. So they did propose a reverse stock split which is basically com combining multiple shares into a single share. In this case, the stock split is between one for two and one for 20. So for example, say you had 20 shares of Virgin Galactic, after a one for 20 split, you would have one share that should be worth the same as those 20 shares were worth. Now, why do you do this? It's because companies need to keep their stock price above $1 in order to maintain their listing on the NASDAQ, and Virgin Galactic has slipped below that point. So the one major strength I've always felt the company had is their ability to raise tons and tons of capital at fairly favorable terms. Seems like those days are ending as the stock price can no longer support any more dilution. And in fact, they're having to go the other way. But the shareholders are not particularly happy about this. And we are seeing even more drops in the share price. It's gone all the way down to about 88 cents per share. Personally, I would expect the split to be more towards the 1 to 20 than the 1 to 2. I mean, why put yourself in the position where you could be back in trouble in short order? And if you think there's any chance you have to raise more capital in the future then maybe they'll have to you know issue more shares in which case the higher the stock price is the better so my money is on more towards the 1 to 20 end if anything but we'll have to wait and see on this one you can see from the chart here just back in July company trading at six dollars per share now all the way down to 88 cents obviously less than one sixth the value that it was at that point very very rough time for Virgin Orbit shareholders. Uh, personally, I do not recommend investing in this one, but if you are a shareholder, I wish you the best and hope for a turnaround with the company. Just a quick note of interest for Blue Origin as well as for Rocket Lab because they did make these escapade satellites that will be launching on the first Blue Origin 
flight to the Red Planet. Uh, in a recent presentation in London on April 24th, NASA's Planetary Protection Officer listed a date of September 29th for the launch of Escapade and Plasma Acceleration and Dynamics Explorers. So basically, we're looking at a first launch of Blue Origin's New Glenn vehicle on September 29th, something that is sure to be a very exciting event. Massive rocket. And uh, really looking forward to see that one goes off. Hopefully they can deliver those rocket lab payloads to Mars safely. Speaking of Rocket Lab, we did have a decent amount of news over the past couple weeks. Obviously, I'm not going to cover all of it here, but just a couple newer items I haven't gone over very much. They they did have a recent launch from New Zealand, which I actually live streamed. So thank you so much if you join me during that live stream. The mission beginning of the swarm lifted off from Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand on April 24th with payloads for a Korea Institute of Sec Science and Technology, as well as a NASA payload that is uh, testing out solar sail technology. Pretty interesting stuff. It did include the kick stage, and the mission was a complete success. So congratulations to the Rocket Lab team. Very fun one to watch. And then we did have another announcement from Rocket Lab today that they're preparing to launch back-to-back -back launches for NASA. These are, of course, those pre-fire missions that have been pushed back in the manifest a few times previously. These two dedicated missions will each deploy one satellite from Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand. First launch is scheduled for May 22nd, and the launch date of the second mission will be scheduled to take place within three weeks of the successful deployment of the first mission. So there are some concerns being raised about the pace of launches in the second quarter and whether Rocket Lab can still hit the 20 to 22 to maybe 24 launch pace for the year that they had kind of set and it seems like at least the first half of the year is lagging that pace a bit. Before we jump to that though I did just want to share a quick picture of their recent Astroscale mission which I thought was pretty cool. They delivered a spacecraft to rendezvous with a bit of space jump in orbit and inspect it and inspect how it's orbiting and spinning and all that kind of stuff in preparation for this company to be able to deorbit space junk. Something that's very important for the sustainability of industry and the commercialization of low earth orbit so really cool picture of this satellite here uh, got very close and another example of rocket labs execution as as they were able to rendezvous with this small bit of space junk a couple interesting articles here for about rocket labs cadence i do want to mention that scott o who is also a YouTuber, was the first one to find and share these, or at least share them. So I uh, do want to give him credit for this, but I did think, you know, if you haven't seen it, I do need to share it with you. But um, that being said, definitely do check out Scott O's YouTube and Twitter if you haven't already, because he is usually pretty good about tracking the Electron Manifest as the launches keep moving around. Anyway, just a quote here from a Rocket Lab official saying Electron is scheduled to launch 20 times this year or double the number of launches the rocket was part of last year. This is Brian Rogers, Senior Director of Global Launch Services. So that was an interesting quote talking about maybe 20 launches this year. Uh, that's a bit of a slipping from the 22, but I think most of us would be pretty happy with that number considering it's doubling the launches in the previous year. However, we did have a LinkedIn post from Kevin Coleman here, who met with Rocket Lab officials, and you can see him pictured with Peter Beck down below. Again, Scott O did share this one as well. <laughs> he said, Rocket Lab has conducted nearly 50 FAA licensed commercial space operations in New Zealand and the United States, with another 20 planned this year. So there's a lot of debate going on about the wording of this, uh, whether that means... 20 in the remainder of this year that really seems like it's how it reads because he's already including you know previous missions this year in this 50 ne nearly 50 is kind of the total rocket lab mission count saying another 20 would make you think or imply that that's 20 beyond the missions we've already had this year if that's possible I lean to this being maybe just a bit of a slip of a tongue or like miss 
kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's just grammar, really. Uh, so I'm thinking they're kind of planning 20 total this year at this point instead of 22. But if they do have 20 more this year planned, obviously I'm, I'm loving it. So uh, let me know how you read those articles. Uh, I think Scott read them a little differently and thought maybe there could be 20 more this year. So he could very well be right on that one as well. Okay, enough from Rocket Lab. So we now have ABL Space, who are not a publicly traded company, but we're very interested in them and the place they do want to take up in the space launch industry. They've been planning for their Flight 2 of their RS-1 rocket for quite a while. This is a small launch vehicle if you're not too familiar with it. Similar in size to Firefly's Alpha rocket, so uh, significantly larger than Electron. Uh, they were planning to launch recently, but they encountered an anomaly during ground testing and quoting from their chief engineer, he said there's no significant delay during ground testing, an issue prevented presented that caused us to roll back to the hangar. We have since resolved and dispositioned the issue. Interesting thing here from Harry Stranger, who is great if you like to get satellite images of rocket launch infrastructure, he did point out that at ABL's launch pad, there's no sign of the RS-1 following that ground testing anomaly earlier in the month. So I guess no significant delay. It's up to you how long of a period significant is. Uh, it looks like it may still be a little while at least before we get that next launch attempt on RS-1, which has not yet flew successfully, but they've had many major upgrades since that first flight. So looking forward to watching this one as well. Now for some less fun news, Momentus has received a NASDAQ deficiency notification regarding delayed 10K form. So basically, Momentus has not submitted this 10K SEC filing that they were due to submit, uh, and they're in trouble with NASDAQ in terms of staying listed as a public company. So they have 60 calendar days from receiving this notice to file the required form or submit to the NASDAQ a plan to regain compliance. Uh, Momentus really does seem to be in a pretty scary place right now. So personally, again, I wouldn't advise investing in this company at this time. It looks a little bit risky to me, but if you are an investor, um, you know, hopefully they can regain compliance, but the cash burn situation has looked a little scary recently for the company. Next up, it looks like the space tractor wars have begun. And no, you did not hear me wrong. <laughs> so Intelsat and CNH have announced a partnership for the connection of tractors and farming equipment to the internet. They have agreed to install, connect, and operate ruggedized multi-orbit satellite terminals on this farming equipment. Uh, this is quite interesting because when you talk about space internet constellations, I have to admit the last thing I had in mind was tractors, but I guess it can make a lot of sense to make sure they're covering the right ground and, you know, optimizing yields and all this kind of stuff. If you will remember previously, SpaceX did announce a partnership with John Deere for similar reasons with their Starlink constellation. So that's why I was kind of saying that the space tractor wars as have begun as Intelsat and SpaceX tried to stake their claim to customers in that farming industry. Uh, yeah, very interesting times for the space industry to be intersecting with the farming industry. Who would have thought? And I did also just want to mention that SpaceX's fourth Starship test flight is still on track for May, according to a NASA official. So yeah, it seems like the pace of these Starship test flights are really picking up speed, and I'm looking forward to see this next one. Let me know, let me know down in the comments below if you think this one will successfully survive re-entry. It's going to be a very exciting launch, and it's coming up pretty soon. So that's all the space industry news I have for you today. Let me know if there's any stories I missed and you think I should have covered or what your thoughts are about any of those stories down below. Try to do these every couple weeks to keep everyone who's investing in the space industry updated on what's been going on. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great day. If you haven't already subscribed, please do consider doing that and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye for now.